Good afternoon. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for coming out to uh, view our talk today or listen to our talk not view I know it's day three so might be feeling a little bit tired so thank you very much um, for coming to listen to us I'm Louisiana I'm from the vegan society we are the oldest vegan society in the world our founders created the term vegan in 1944 we also run the world's largest and oldest vegan oh. certification scheme uh, we register all types of products we recently registered 60 thousand products um, so yeah lots of exciting things happening in the vegan world um, I'll let my lovely panelists introduce themselves would you like to start sure absolutely can you hear me no. can Hello. you I'm not on am I no you can hear me now okay great uh, so <laughs> I'm Henry I'm one half of Bosch we make uh, vegan recipes we do them in videos we make very tasty videos we do a lot of cookbooks as well which um, a million of you lovely people have bought and we're very grateful for you for that and we've also started doing food in supermarkets recently yeah. and this is Ian yeah I'm Ian I'm the other half of Bosch and I'm very very pleased to be around loads of people yes yeah eating loads of tasty food and having chats it's like the world's almost normal again it's exciting yeah yes. uh, hi and I'm uh, Rick Roberts I am the GM for a business called Plant Heads whose first product has come to market is called Cracked the No Egg Egg um, and we are the world's most versatile vegan egg replacer. It's good stuff. It is good stuff. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> right, thank you. So, question one, this is for Henry and Ian, so whichever one wants to answer, if you sure. want to both come in. So, in the five and a half years since you have launched, the vegan food and drink market has been absolutely transformed, as I'm sure we all know, in the UK and beyond that. In terms of your own achievements, there's been quite a few. So you've had, is it five cookery books, cookery show, numerous products on supermarket shelves, a huge social media following. What I'm interested in knowing is how you were able to connect with and grow your audience. Has your audience changed over time? And why do you think they are so connected to the ethos of Bosch and your story as a whole? Great question. Mm. I mean, the world's just changed dramatically over the last five years. You were just saying before that we're at this amazing food fair and there's, you know, both plant-based food, vegan food and lots of non-vegan food. And that's the busiest area yep. over there. So that's crazy <laughs> exciting. When we set this up five, six years ago, there wasn't, you couldn't find a vegan takeaway on Google. You couldn't buy a vegan sandwich in Pret or anywhere. So it's amazing to see how the world's changed. I think our audience, um, have kind of evolved with us and we found that there's been flexitarians all the way because we have never kind of gone on in a big way about the term vegan we've always been pretty chill about using that word but interestingly six years ago you would have used the word vegan and it would put people off but today the word vegan actually it's actually a sales pitch mm. now you'll see like we see crazy little uh, corner shops that have the word vegan on their sign mm. yeah, just to great. bring people in so it's been amazing to see how everything has changed I think that our online audiences are, are really excited about what this new world has, has to offer and making all these food products available to everybody mm. is so crucial to keep that going. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Did you have anything to add? Yeah. I mean, uh, we started on social media and then we kind of went into books and then we went into products into supermarkets. And I think the reason why the products in supermarkets have done really well is because our audience believe us because mm. we've been there right from the get go. We're not just like doing a vegan product because it's the in thing. We do it because we really believe about like it and uh, everyone seems to love the products, which is marvelous. Yeah. 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 I think it's so interesting because people, people really trust the people behind the brands as much as they trust the products. Yeah. And even if you're appealing to flexitarians, that's something which flexitarians are interested in as well. So yeah, thank you. Uh, Rick, so you manage quite a, a different brand and a different product. It's something completely new to the market in the UK. Um, and I'm sure that's come with its own set of challenges in terms of MPD, manufacturing and so on. I'm sure there's lots to come in the future for Cracks, but at the moment you manage just one product line. So firstly, how did you know that this was going to be a success? How do you keep customers engaged with that product? And are there any unique positive opportunities that come with managing a single product line? Um, okay, so uh, firstly, um, we, don't, we don't know it's going to be a success once we're at 50 million pound brand then I think we'll sit there and say we're a big success 
Um, but what we do know is that the egg category, traditional egg category, is worth about 227 billion globally. True. And um, if you listen to the Good Food in Institute, they say egg replacement is worth about 1.5 million in four years' time. If you listen to um, another uh, agency, they'll sit there and say it's 1.5 million right now. So we know it's a massive area, um, which is pretty underdeveloped at the moment. And we know it's very, very difficult to actually replicate an egg. Mm. So it's kind of like the holy grail. There are lots of vegetarians who would love to be vegans, but just can't make that last step of giving up eggs. Mm. So we know it's a huge opportunity area um, as a market. Um, with regards to the amount of um, products we've got, we've got one retail product. So we've currently got a 490 gram um, egg, liquid egg replacer, but we also make our product in a powder format. We've got the traditional version that we launched with, and then 12 months later, we've come out with version two already. So we actually have two powders in the marketplace, which you can use for manufacturing. They're not retail packs, but you can use them for um, manufacturing. Great, thank you. Um, so moving on to talking about some retailers, because I'm sure this is something that a lot of people are interested in. So as we've already said, the vegan market is, is booming. Customers really are spoiled for choice these days, which is fantastic. But obviously this means that retailers are spoiled for choice when it comes to what products to stock. You have independently owned brands, other branded products and supermarket owned brands all competing for space. And I'm assuming this could be quite challenging if you work in a food and drink business like yourselves. So Rick, in just 18 months since you have launched, is it 18 months? Yeah, yep, roundabout. You've entered into a number of retailers and I've heard you've recently <laughs> had some creative tactics to gain the attention of even more. So can you tell us a little bit more about that or about how, um, how brands can get the attention of retailers? Um, yeah, so I'm never giving in. Um, just keep on, uh, you've got to keep on going with the, the, the uh, retailers. So um, in my experience over the past 18 months, but over 25 years of being an FMCG, um, there's never been such a turnover of head office staff um, at the retailers that there has been t at, at this moment. So it's really a c case of being tenacious. Mm. Um, I think that um, OGS, as an example, another, uh, you know, uh, 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 somebody who's working in our space, have done a, uh, a brilliant job using consumers to kind of bombard buyers and they got their millionaire shortcake um, listed into Tesco by doing that. I think that's a really great way of doing it. We did some um, sampling trucks on Pancake Day and you know, I'm not ashamed to say we stalked the retailers that we weren't <laughs> outside um, nice. currently so that, you know, in the hope that, oh, there's some people downstairs with this crazy yellow van, they're making amazing pancakes, go down and try them. Um, so we've done that. Um, we also, um, a lot of the last couple of years, whilst we've been launched, obviously we've all been locked down. So um, there's been obviously a lot of trade shows or a lot of um, IGD shows, etc., that have been gone online. And I found out that actually those questions that they're asked at the end are not all from bots. So I have asked a number of questions to a number of the commercial directors who are presenting at either a co-op or a Tesco do, et cetera, about vegan products and how do we get more vegan products into your mm -hmm. uh, range? And then obviously they respond publicly and then you can use that to affect with your buyers as well. Nice. Clever. Great, thank you. So talking a little bit more about uh, branding and marketing, so this is a question uh, for either of you. So specifically thinking about your products in supermarkets and food service, you've got a very unique branding style. So including yourselves and your personalities within your products, uh, the colors, the fonts, they all stand out quite a lot. When I see Bosch immediately, I know what it is. Um, is there anything in particular from a branding point of view that you've had to change since you've launched? How have you managed to stay so relevant in such a rapidly growing market? Yeah, I guess, um, we've, I mean, we've updated our logo. And yeah. I guess everybody does yeah, their first yeah. logo and it's a bit rubbish. Like yeah. we did it in Photoshop, mm -hmm. uh, but now we've had a proper designer do it. It looks a bit more, um, a bit more impressive. Yeah. In fact, if any of you have got our books and you've got the first book, and then if you've got maybe the third book and the fourth book, you'll see the logo change yeah. between the two. Um, so I think we've had to grow up as a brand, but you know, six years ago, it was all a bit health food shop. Mm. All of everything had a, like mm. a, 
a natural field with a sunrise on it or something like that. All the brands just felt very uncool and unsexy. Mm -hmm. So we purposefully wanted to come in with that, you know, very bold, very bashy, very standout Bosch. I think it worked with the books. The fact we did a black cookbook helped the book jump off the shelf yeah. with neon colors. We then tried to replicate that with food. So to create packaging that just jumped off the shelf and it, it hit your eyeballs and you knew what you were looking at. I think we've made that work. Um, we haven't had to have too many, make too many compromises in that space yet. Maybe the fact that we've got our faces on the pictures mm. helps. Um, so you've got a little Henry and Ian on each pack, which <laughs> is always helpful. Yeah. I guess it has been interesting though, hasn't it? Trying to get into supermarkets because we've done everything the other way around. We kind of built this video marketing platform first yep. and then we've tried to find our way into supermarkets, which has certainly been a bit easier, I think. Yeah, it definitely helps having like a big audience on social media and already mm -hmm. a name because the buyers are obviously kind of wowed by that, but they're also like, so the wild by the name and also the fact that the products that we sell are good because they mm. go through our kind of taste test and we like tasty food. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, it's with regard to the packaging that's in the supermarkets, we don't actually make our own stuff. We work with licensing partners um, and with each new licensing partner that we've got, we've kind of tweaked the packaging a little bit, so it's kind of just improve in increments. The latest thing that we've got out is the uh, ready meals that are available in mm. Morrison's. And I would say out of all the packaging that we've got, that's the best one. So I think what we'll aim to do is to tweak the packaging the others to get it to that level. Mm. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so it's just an iterative process and just sort of just improving as we go. And if we keep on doing that, we'll hit perfection one day. Never. No, <laughs> it's like painting the fourth bridge yeah. in Scotland, isn't it? Where once yeah. you finish it, you have to start again. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> What's your journey been like with packaging? Um, so for us, we um, I joined about two years ago, and um, we originally, I mean, the company name is called Plant Heads, but that was originally what we were going to go to market with as a brand. And as Henry just point, kind of said, the, the branding pretty much looked like you would expect a massive, great, big, safe FMCG holistic company to do. So one of the first things we did actually was just just throw all that all that work away. Um, we worked with a design agency called MK21, based mm -hmm. out in Milton Keynes, <laughs> and they came up with the cracked logo and the no egg egg and what we see in the marketplace today. So um, that was um, that was a massive change from where we were originally. And then, with regards to what we do with the rest of the packaging, as I'm sure you guys do as well. I mean, you've got a much much bigger community than we have, but. Um, our community, we sit there and go to them, okay, so we're low in fat, we're low in salt, we're low in sugar, we're high, you know, we're, we're high in protein, high in vitamins. What things do you want us to, what's mm. important? What do you want us to put on the packaging? Because yeah. if you put too much on, then no one reads any of yeah. it. Yeah, it's so mm. true. So, Unless um, it's a box of cereal. Uh, yeah, because then you've got time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then you've got time, exactly. Yeah. All right, so another question about packaging and branding. Um, interested to hear your thoughts about eco-labeling. So eco-labeling is rapidly becoming a point of discussion in the food and drinks industry. Are you planning on doing that? Well, it might be mandated by the government soon. I've heard that's, that's in the talks, but are you planning on doing this yourselves? And do you think this will bring a shift to consumer purchasing habits? We think it's an amazing idea. Um, there was that study by Joseph Poor um, the Oxford University researcher where he kind of did this massive global study of all meat-based foods and all plant-based foods and pretty much said if you stack up all the meat in the world it's all more polluting than all of the plant-based foods in the world and here's an idea as a system we could do carbon labeling mm. and he even made a suggestion of, as to how it would look so very smart chap giving us a really easy option so if the government are thinking about it i think mm. that's fantastic um, it's hard to work out as we talked about before um, but i think if the government mandate it we'll be all over it mm. and maybe we'll be able to, to persuade our team some of them are here eyeballing me right now maybe we'll be able to persuade them that we can do it sooner mm. okay. but it is a lot of work yeah mm. agreed rick yeah and i think from my perspective it's it's pretty easy to blow a hole right through it so you can either spend five grand doing it or 50 grand doing it depending which agency you're working with and i think that if you are so we're we are looking at it with the carbon trust at the mm. moment and i think if you are going to do it and you're going to put yourself out there and say okay we are now good from a carbon perspective 
you better make sure that you can back that up because consumers nowadays aren't just going to read it and go, oh, okay, they say they're okay, they're okay. They're going to want to know the detail behind yeah, it. Yeah, definitely. And we've used a couple of agencies which got us to the Carbon Trust where you can really see the diligence behind it and therefore the worth of it when you actually put it on your packaging. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So do you have anything to add? Um, <clears throat> with the, uh, so with packaging, are you thinking about the labeling on the packaging mm. or the physical packaging itself? Front of pack. Yeah, front of pack. Yeah, I think uh, yeah, I echo what these two have said, basically. Yeah, I think yeah. it's really important to sort of uh, know where your food's coming from and to, like, if you, because we've got the traffic light system for fat and sugar mm. and yeah. salt and whatnot, so have that for carbon or air miles. I think it would, having that right there would make a lot of people change their, what they're about to buy. They, mm. It would influence their decision in a positive way, so I think it's a great shout. Well, as it stands, we're like consumers haven't really got anything to go on mm. other than brands' self-proclaimed claims. And a lot of them are doing that greenwashing thing and saying, oh, look, we're so carbon friendly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think having a standardization, ultimately we've got to get there so people can make better choices. I think yeah. be, there's quite a cool app there. <laughs> It's like how carbon friendly is your yeah. uh, thing. So you just go into the supermarket, z get the app out, zap the uh, barcode, and it tells you the carbon miles of it. Yeah. So some kind of, you know, like forward thinking activist could do that. And then it will automatically plant a tree. Yeah, that would be cool. <laughs> Oh, yeah, fun, maybe. Someone yeah. take that away and make that happen, please. Now, it's, it's going to be a really interesting one because there's a few companies offering the service and, it, you know, the app idea. There's, there's people making a lot of money off this as well. Mm. So I think. Um, I think if the government mandates it, I think that must be the only way forward. Because otherwise, yeah. if everyone's using different systems, how it, is it that going? It doesn't really make sense. It's like no. the credit yeah. crunch when everyone was just rating themselves. Yeah. yeah. Triple A. It's like, what does that even mean? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. 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 It'd be an interesting one for sure. Mm. Um, so there's a number of vegan brands who've been running for, for decades. Uh, but for many, this is a, a fairly new industry. We're all learning together regarding what works, what doesn't work. Um, and on top of that, consumer preferences are changing all the time, even you know, vegan consumer preferences. All this innovation and pace of change that really happened in the last five to seven years or so. And with that, there's been def different levels of success and failure. Many vegan categories have seen double or triple digit growth in the last few years. And though this is impressive, this is thought to be slowing down. So we discussed this before, the Financial Times have reported that sales of plant-based meats in the US have fallen uh, or plateaued for the first time in years, and a similar pattern might follow suit in the UK. So the term trend is obviously used a lot for the vegan and plant-based market. Uh, veganism is obviously a lot more than a trend, uh, but for the people involved, let alone the animals involved in the industry as well. So how do we ensure that we, we really keep people engaged in vegan and plant-based and you know it, it's not just a trend it's something which is really here to stay and how do we bring new customers along this is a continued challenge uh, for the yeah. whole industry but do you have any any thoughts on that yeah i think um from a from a kind of uh, personal perspective because we are speaking to our audience you're just basically one person talking to another being friendly and welcoming and inviting and accepting of everybody, whatever journey they're on, is really crucial. So it's very easy for us to get like locked up in our bubble of cooking vegan food and going vegan this and vegan that and vegan that and realize that that word still does alienate a lot of people. Yeah. So I think um, in order to keep bringing in flexitarians and making it easy for them to have one vegan meal instead of maybe one meat-based meal, it's keeping on being, uh, being friendly and being welcoming. And that applies to our speech, it applies to our branding, it applies to our marketing and trying to make sure we're continuing on that journey. I think that um, we don't get too rattled by these negative headlines like, oh my goodness, plant-based sales are down, the fad is over. It's like, okay, right, so some journalist is trying to have a pop at this thing, which frankly is not a trend because it's based in really solid backing. It's got, you know, ultimately it is better for the planet for us to eat more plant-based mm. things. It's a good thing for your health as long as you're doing it well and having a high fiber, whole foods plant-based diet. And it is nice for animals because we can all agree that factory farming is probably not a great thing. So you know, trends come and they go and they're based on, is it cool to look like you're from the 90s or, you know, from the 80s or whatever. But this is like a shift in consumer behavior. It might dip, it might go up, it might go down, but ultimately it's going to keep on growing. Yeah. yeah. I mean, 
there's a lot of money being spent by supermarkets and brands on infrastructure. And uh, I don't think any brand really wants to spend a bunch of money uh, to, to, to start making this product to get it into supermarkets for then to just let that stop. Mm. I think they'll just reinvest and keep on plugging it if it if it wanes slightly. So I think that like the fact that the infrastructure has been built for plant-based food to flourish in big supermarkets is one indication that it will probably stick Absolutely. around. Like you say about the uh, emotional connection that people have to veganism. But I think the role of influencers is actually really important here. And I think the role of influencers shouldn't be underestimated and it's probably one of the main reasons why it's so big now. And when I say influencer, I don't mean, um, you know, someone taking photographs of themselves on Instagram. I'm talking about, you know, someone like Kim, uh, Kip Anderson, who's made Cowspiracy. I would consider him an influencer because he's influenced an awful lot of people mm -hmm. by the creative work that he's done. So I think the more people who get into it and who are creative and are using TikTok and their mobile phone and like po posting videos of tasty food on the internet, but you see it just growing and growing and growing. It might get slower, but I think it's going to get bigger and bigger. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, if it has if it has plateaued in the US, it may well be because the 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 quality of the product that you are putting out into the market is at a level which is acceptable for X amount of people. And what I saw, I've just been, I've just come back from Expo West, and what I'm seeing is a new kind of quality of product. So, mm. you know, there's Levy Bacon over here, for example, which is just like, we were talking about yeah, this earlier. Yeah, yeah. It's like good. amazing. And when you get to those kind of products that are so good that the consumer won't know the difference, yeah. suddenly you're not talking to 80 million vegans, you're talking to all the flexitarians in the world. And if you can get your cost down, and get a, pro a product from a quality which you can't tell the difference of, then why wouldn't you mm. choose that? It makes perfect sense. It makes perfect yeah. sense to do that for all the reasons that Henry mm. said as well. Mm. Did you try Mi Myoko's new cheese over in America? Uh, no, I haven't had yeah, that. Apparently like, they've done really good things with this cottage cheese where they've kind of uh, like taken milk, uh, like vegan milk and cultured it and then grown cheese. It's like, it's next level. It's such a good yeah. point that you make though that, uh, you know, ultimately we've got good enough products everywhere and now we need excellent products yeah. and we need those excellent products to be at least the same as, if not cheaper than the real thing, which they must be able to get to because it is, is still ultimately a, a kind of inefficient system to rear an animal. Yeah. Mm. Whereas actually you, we <laughs> should be able to build factory processes that can do that with soybeans, mm. hopefully. Yeah. Yeah, all really good points. I think there's so much pressure on, on the vegan food industry to be perfect and to have all the answers. Yes. And there's, it's happened so quickly, we forget that it was only 2019 when Greg's brought out the vegan sausage roll. That was not that long ago and that made headlines. That is such a normal thing to see now in every food service place and that, that was revolutionary when that came out and that was three years ago. Yeah. So, you know, we're learning, we're learning as we're going. Mm. Um, Talking about making things you know, cheaper, or why are things more expensive? Um, obviously, it's a really complex area. There's a, there's a lot to do with um, the way the government finances different, different parts of the food system. So vegan brands are usually more expensive than non-vegan counterparts. Um, do you have any plans to change this? Maybe I'll direct that to Rick, first of all. Okay. Um, yeah, so I mean, Cracked is about 65, 70% more expensive than an egg. Um, we don't have the scale at the moment mm -hmm. that you know a $237 billion egg category has, right? So we need to, we need to get uh, more customers engaged where we will sell more product, which will mean that we'll be able to buy better, we'll be able to make it better uh, and cheaper. I mean, techno technologically, making our product is quite difficult. So we make it, we acidify control it to make sure that it's safe. But then we also have to go and put it through a process called high pressure processing, which is in a separate place. So, you know, there's there's food miles and there's technological things that make all this very difficult to do. Mm. As you become bigger and you get more customers and, you know, we're in the States and there are a lot of, lot of interest out in the States for the brand, then you get to the stage where you sit there and go, okay, now I can start lowering the price. Mm. And you've seen Just do that. Just were at $8 two years ago. And Beyond they're at four and yeah, beyond, so, exactly. Yeah. So you can get there um, 
Uh, it, it just takes a bit of time. So our aim is to get to price parity with eggs. When we can do that is another challenge. Yeah. Right. So for us, it's, it's price has always been important for us. Um, I think we, at the very beginning of Bosch, we thought, okay, wh what do we want to be about? And we landed on the phrase plant-based food for everyone. We didn't want to make a burger that cost 13 pounds. Mm. Um, we would prefer to have ready meals mm. that could retail at kind of two pounds and three pounds, make them available to everybody, or make our nooch available to everybody, which by the way, you can get yeah. in a lot more supermarkets now. So yeah. um, I, think, I think availability is so key because there is a real small subsection of people that will pay that premium price, mm. but to get that mass market, it's all about getting that price down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, bit of a nicer question now. Mm. What do you enjoy most about working in the category? That's you. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, the politeness. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I really. Um, so I used to work at PepsiCo, and um, uh, if you, were, you if you went to a conference or something with Pe at PepsiCo, and there were Coke people in the room, you're not allowed to talk to them. Really. So um, I used to find that a lot of fun. So I used to go. I used to hide my badge and go up to the Coke people, start engaging them in conversation, then show my badge and watch them run off. What, what I've really enjoyed about working in this industry is everyone is so collaborative. Oh, yeah. So um, there's lots of people who are all trying to, you know, so I was, at, I was at Expo West a couple of weeks ago. This buyer from Albertsons came up to me, said, love your product, but I want it in a powdered format for retail. And I went, oh, there's a guy making an egg replacement over there who does it in powdered. And she went, oh, right, okay. And I said, so I'll take you over there. So I took her over there and dropped it off. You wouldn't get that in PepsiCo or soft drinks or any of the F other FMC industries that I've worked in. So I really like that. I really like the fact everyone's collaborative. I like the fact that we're all trying to do something different and do it for a purpose. That's really refreshing. Um, so lots and lots of reasons to enjoy this category. I think um, for, for me, it's the communication that we get from our audience. So whether it's a DM in Instagram or a message on Facebook with someone saying, um, your recipes have changed my life. You, you've enabled me to go vegan, which has brought down my cholesterol. And we've, had, we've done book signings where people have come up to us and you've got guys with tears in their eyes because they've lo like lost half their body weight or we've helped save their mum's life because of yeah, diabetes. That's Chris guy. Yeah. yeah. yeah like, so that stuff um, is really, really heartwarming. But also, just every time someone tags us in an Instagram picture of a recipe that we've made or a product that we've sold them and, uh, and they're glowing about it it's like it's so rewarding and yeah. every single one of those you see it kind of just gives you more impetus to go and do more and to keep it keep that ball rolling you know so yeah I think this is the most exciting place in food right yeah. now you know this is where all the innovation is happening if you're a chef even if you're not vegan it's just exciting to see what new things you could create with new products that are on the market or you know doing the technical stuff like you're doing um, and actually inventing something completely new so it's just exciting in this space yeah yeah I agree with all of that yeah those messages you receive that yeah it must be amazing yeah. um so thinking about other brands which other brands do you think are doing doing a really great job because i know there's plenty there's plenty here today plenty not here today um any you particularly enjoy um, good question. Well, I mean, I'm just thinking like who we have to talk about officially. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, first of all, the Bosch products. Mm -hmm. Every major supermarket, you've got our cakes. <laughs> the Nooch is absolutely banging, and um, mm -hmm. we're just really proud of. We've got some new pestos coming, which we're very excited about, um, as well as our ready meals. Yeah, we're uh, really big fans of Aura. Mm -hmm. They're over there. We're, we've known them for a little bit, and we've actually just collaborated with them to make a vegan chorizo burger, which you, it, we've launched today. So In fact, it's over there. Yeah. Yeah, which with, is, with our little logo and the faces on it. Yeah, man, it's, that's really, really delicious. Who what else? Um, kind of like fruit pastels. You like fruit pastels, yeah? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're good. Yeah, they're good. They're they, vegan now, I which is great. I think they're vegan trademark, actually, I think. Yeah, yeah are they? Possibly, nice. yeah. Good. I'm getting a maybe nod from my colleague at the back. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Any brands you particularly like? Um, so we talked about Le Vie. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, man. I mean, I love that bacon. Um, uh, I think from an awareness perspective, the guys at VFC are doing a tremendous job. Yeah. 
they're getting yeah. a lot of coverage and I think they just dropped they dropped their trousers the other day for a bit of PR for uh, being honest and open about their eco credentials so I think they're doing a great job um, there's they a, drop their trousers. Yeah, they drop. What do you mean? They literally I know drop. what he's talking about, but if you don't, then that does sound a bit. Yeah, sorry. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> so there, there's an advert of them actually with their trousers down, right. saying we've told everyone about our eco credentials. <laughs> Why don't you? Right. So, um, oh yeah, sorry. That Hilarious. I love that. <laughs> um, and um, there's a guy um, who runs a burger chain in London, and I think he's got some in Brighton as well. Uh, Ross Forder at um, Halo Burger. Yeah, oh, yeah they nice. may brilliant burgers yeah. um, and I just love the fact that he's sitting there quite openly trying to take the big guys on mm. yeah. um, uh, quite overtly which I think is really great yeah man yeah, that's what I like about VFC as well. They're really proudly a vegan brand, and I think they came out recently and said they refuse to use the word plant-based because vegan, the word vegan shouldn't have negative connotations. We're past that point, and we should be trying to change the conversations and actually really, you know, all these different tactics are, are going to help the industry. Not one tactic is right, yeah. whether you're choosing to use vegan or not, but I like, I like what they stand for. It's quite refreshing to see. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I think we're coming up to the end of t uh, the talk. I think we're going to move on to to Q&A in a second but just before we do anything exciting coming out this year anything big that you wanted to talk about briefly I mean we we I feel like we had this two-year COVID closed down yeah. where you know everyone dealt with that in different ways me and Ian were living in the same house mm -hmm. so it kind of worked okay because we could just go down to the basement and keep filming videos and everyone was doing lives for yeah. some reason so we did that too um, but we've now moved into this new phase of Bosch Ben's just joined us he's there head of social um, there's Tom at the back it's his first day today which we're very excited about as well as Guy but we we've moved into a kind of shoot space office space in Old Street so it's gonna be really cool for us to be together lots more videos lots more collaborations so we'll be looking to do lots more collaborations with other vegan chefs cooks whoever yeah. so that's gonna be an exciting phase for Bosch yeah. Yeah. and with regard to products we're currently in baked goods we're chilled uh, ambient and we're about to branch into frozen uh, so that's going to be quite exciting as well so heard it here first guys yes <laughs> um, so for us this year um, we are going to follow up all the stuff that we got we, we were absolutely bombarded at Expo West so um, we've got lots of potential off, uh, opportunities out in the States which we haven't focused on up until this point um, there's some other international business that we're looking at at the moment as well so currently just because of resource uh, we've got 70 countries on hold at the moment which we can't 70 70 countries wow. on hold we need to hire some more staff God, exactly how many which, are there in the world <laughs> there's only like 260 yeah, yeah. quite yeah. a lot yeah yeah, wow. yeah I know tell me about it so um, so we are hiring more staff actually um, we're also um, uh, we've just launched for version 2 we're in development of version 3 already um, we've got um, big conversations happening in some QS, QSR chains as QSRs kind of come back and open back up now that we're open back up and we're also looking at other kind of where our consumer would expect our brand to be kind mm. of products yeah. so um, uh, kind of where you'd expect something that was largely made from an egg to be you have to try and nail a plant-based shell so the cracks can go in an egg yeah, <laughs> I just I don't know whether or not that would put people off. Actually, <laughs> like maybe I, 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 the the novelty would be a, a winner for me anyway. Okay, well, I'll, I'll, we'll have a look. Yeah, <laughs> great. Lots of exciting things then. Cool. Um, if anyone can't stay for the Q and A, I just mentioned now that Henry and Ian will be doing a book signing at the Vegan Trademark Store, which is just down there um, after the talk. But is there any other any well not other questions? Is there a question? Uh, would anyone like to ask any questions to the panel? There's one over there. Oh, there. <laughs> Is that a resounding no? No, there was no, one. No, oh, right. Okay, the, good. The, They're just working out the microphone the situation. <laughs> can you beatbox in the yeah, meantime? I can try. No, no, no. no. <laughs> the mysterious wandering microphone. Ah, oh, see. Uh, yeah, just a, a quick question for uh, somebody who's going to start out from the very beginning. I love how you built the social community. Where do you even start? 
Oh man. Um, well, our head of social is here, so we should probably bring him up to answer that. But uh, in, in short, I would say um, using your phone, you know, do you know what's funny is we spent all this money on cameras and lights over the last five years, like leasing all of this gear. And now uh, you actually, it's a problem to use the, the camera and the lights because it's essentially online audiences want authenticity. They want stuff that is shot with the phone. So get on TikTok, get on Instagram. They're probably the two priorities and just start documenting stuff. I don't know what your business is or what you should be talking about, but do it, do it, throw away, do it as if you don't care, do it as if nobody's watching, do it every day, multiple times every day, and don't stop. That's what we've been doing for pretty much the last six years. Yeah. So that would be my advice. Another question, there was a couple down the front and one at the back uh, on the side. If you were to look at your journey for the last five years and for Cracked as well, where are the things that you would have gone differently? Are there things that you would have changed about your approach and sort of reviewing those five years? Uh, oh, do you want to start? Okay. Um, so, I mean, it's easy to look back with hindsight, isn't it? I don't think we'd have launched the product if we'd have um, uh, done it with hindsight because when we launched the product, we made it as a baking product. Um, so, you know, the big thing was you could make Yorkshire puddings with it, mm -hmm. which the vegan community s traditionally struggled to make decent uh, uh, Yorkshire puddings with um, egg replacers. Um, but when we launched, within a couple of weeks, people were scrambling our product, and we knew that although you could scramble it, it wasn't, it wasn't designed for that purpose. So we then went into build, bringing out version two, which has taken about six to nine months to develop. But I guess. The, I guess what I'm trying to say is we could have waited until we had a scrambled product and then launched a product that did both, but we wouldn't have got to that place unless we'd launched. So there's lots of things, you know, bits and pieces on the branding that we didn't have to start with, that we've now kind of finessed as we've gone through. Um, so yeah, lots of reasons, lots of things. Mm. Uh, I think what we would probably have done differently is Initially, we focused all of our effort onto one platform, which was Facebook, and uh, we did like we basically ignored every other platform. And then we thought, oh, we should give this Instagram thing a whirl. Um, and then we did that, and that seemed doing quite well. But then we didn't really focus our energy enough on YouTube at the beginning. And if we had done, our numbers would be way bigger, our reach would be way bigger, and um, you know, our influence would be way bigger. And also, another thing is that we didn't jump on TikTok maybe as quick as we should have. We should have done that six months before. Um, but other than that, I think, yeah, no regrets, really. Nice. I think there was another question on that um, row. Uh, it's for me. Um, big fan of Bosch as a brand and Frozen category too. So what are you bringing to the category? Uh, was that a big fan of Bosch? Thank you very much, by the way. Cakes are great. <laughs> uh, and what are we bringing to the Frozen category? Yes, yes, please. I'm not sure we can specifically say at this point. No. Um, but I will hint to you <laughs> that you know, if you look in our cookbooks, you'll see we love things that are absolutely delicious, like maybe sweet treats and things. Um, right. And uh, I mean, sausages and Bosch kind of rhymes. Yeah. Doesn't it? You've got Boschages. <laughs> so uh, maybe we'll try something in that realm. But we've, we've got a few different places that we're looking. Um, but it's, it's early days as yet, I would say. Right. That would be my next question. When should we wait for it? <laughs> yes. I, I hope you'll see Bosch in the frozen category in the next year. And uh, it takes a while, you know, to put these really? food products together. Mm -hmm. We might, I don't know, we, people are over there who might have a different answer to that. Um, but yeah, soon. Cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. I think there was another question. Um, yes, towards the back. Sorry, I didn't get here early enough to get a seat. No. Um, so, uh, Rick, you're exporting. You're, you're exporting. I don't know if Bosch, you're exporting as well. I'm just wondering how you square your sustainability ambitions with exporting. What's the story you tell? So we, I mean, we haven't come to market with a sustainability um, story for exactly the reason I mentioned when we were talking about um, uh, making sure your eco credentials are kind of you can justify them. So we're doing that piece of work in at the background at the moment, and when we when we get that right, then we'll we'll talk about our how we are from a sustainable perspective. I mean, when I when I joined the company two years ago, we were going to be in a, v, a Virgin uh, PET bottle. 
we went to 50% and this year we'll go to 100%. But with regards to exporting, um, we, currently, um, we currently are exporting to um, Holland. So, um, you know, it's a great question about how do, you, how do you justify the growth of the brand, but also offset the, the, the environmental impact of that as well. And when we've got a really clear idea of where we are, then we'll work out how we're going to make that better. Yeah, and we're, we're kind of similar. I mean, we're not exporting at the moment, um, but you know, outside of that, just talking about environmental credentials on the whole, um, it's, it's a journey. Like, none of us are perfect. We are, we are in the process of providing people plant-based options, which are more sustainable inherently than meat-based options. Um, but it's not perfect, it's not a perfect system. We go as far as we can to be recyclable, which is pretty much everything that we've got. There are some little bits of film uh, that you just can't get recyclable as yet, but we're very much trying to be at the forefront of that journey to having completely recyclable packaging. Um, and it's a really important issue for us. We will be looking to become a B Corp over the next year, and this is something we'll be drilling into a lot more because it's so important to us. Mm. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Any on this side? Yeah. Yeah. Well. Or, or we'll take you and then yeah. The, I think the question was how important is it for our customers to be that sustainable? Oh. Uh, two oh, questions, two both questions. people ask the same thing. Um, I, think, I think en masse, you know, if we were to do the 80-20 approach, we'd probably find that 80% of people weren't that bothered and they were just in the shop picking something up. But that 20% of people are bothered and they're vocal and they're important. Mm. But I think for us, to be honest, it's not about the customers, it's about our yeah. our kind of purpose. Yeah. And we did set Bosch up for an environmental purpose. Yeah. Um, so it is important to us, yeah. regardless of what customers think. Yeah, it's almost like we want to take the decision away from the consumer yeah. by just doing the best that we possibly can. But I think this year, like we have to face the true facts, where it's going to be a rocky year, right? Financially, a lot of people are going to be like not in a good place, uh, especially with like rising costs and stuff. So I think an awful lot of the big environmental work that's been done, we realistically, some of it might be lost yeah. because people are just going to be thinking, I need to save money. I can't pay my bills. So, um, so yeah, it's. It, I think the brands have a big responsibility to do their best so the consumer can do their best without thinking about it. Mm. Yeah. Any other, I think we've got time for one more if anyone does have another one. Right, if not, um, thank you so much again for, for coming. Oh, nice. Thank you very much everyone. Thank you. thank you. And thank you for hosting. Oh, yeah, thanks. thanks for hosting. Uh, we'll hang around for a few minutes and um, Henry and Ian will be at the store doing a book signing as well if anyone is interested in that. And selfies. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>